recently found in the soil of Africa. Animal or man? This is the skull of a man as he was in the beginning. Recently seen in Africa, an anthropoid ape of today. There's a close relationship between man and animal, not only in build, but also in behavior. But when T.H. Huxley announced that man was descended from the apes, a bishop's wife exclaimed, let us hope that it is not true, but if it is, let us pray that it doesn't become generally known. <laughs> Life has spread out in countless forms, evolved over millions of years according to the conditions provided by water, air and earth for their existence. Life was given the forms and numbers which made survival possible. It was given the weapons for the preservation of life often at the cost of other lives. To reproduce, to continue to exist, is the main driving force of life. Some are protected by deceptive shapes. Some unobtrusively adapting to the environment as a defense against others. 
some by being almost transparent or still as a stone. Others assume a striking appearance as a sign of danger, often by vivid colors. strange, marvelously beautiful, mysterious creatures developed this appearance because it was evidently necessary for them to be like this. Otherwise, they would no longer exist. And so, penguins are built to catch the swift fish, but also to withstand the force of the breakers. struggle has only one purpose. They must breed on dry land. And quite a few want to. In one single area, numerous animal species can live together peacefully because they don't all eat the same kind of food. The wildebeest and the zebra, for instance, eat shorter types of grass. And the buffalo? Let's see. Yes, long grass. The dick dick can be small because he feeds on low shrubs. This big fellow can reach much higher and will eat anything on a tree. But not as high as this one, who's developed a long neck and long legs and can take its food from places which others cannot reach. In this food chain, even droppings play a useful role. The dung beetle lays its eggs in them. This lizard knows it and lives on the eggs. In the same territory, the beasts of prey also get their share. They are built for the swift and agile capture of their prey. The only chance the prey has is to be even swifter and more agile in flight. Beasts of prey kill to eat, detached and matter of fact. Man is a more fatal killer. He's exterminated whole species. The quagga, extinct since 1883. The blue bock, extinct since 1799. The Cape lion, extinct since 1865. The Falkland wolf, extinct since 1876. The striped anteater, wiped out. The grey's wallaby and the hare kangaroo, gone. The pink-headed duck, extinct. The great orc, extinct. 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 Ex... No, he's still alive. But how many are there left? Well, this one's dead. 
we're sometimes kind to animals. Our pets, we've taken their evolution in hand ourselves, following the fashions. Some dogs are prepared to do something in return. In India, the cow is even sacred, touching not allowed. And what can we not do with animals? You can get a little bird to tell your fortune. You can bet on them and let the winner live to fight another day. You can have so much fun with animals, whether they like it or not. And then this sport, for those who are sporting enough to pull a strap tightly around a horse's genitals. It's painful, but they buck so much better. love of animals is everlasting. And for those we don't eat, no grave can be too pretty. We also use animals in experiments to discover facts about ourselves. Okay. 
such as the electronic control of the brain of a cat, which starts to prowl at the touch of a button. Another button makes it start to chew. The current is switched off. How did this come about? Are we so strong? Sometimes you think so, but no. If you compare that with an elephant. We pride ourselves on world walking records, but compared with animals, we're nowhere. And those pitiful bare feet of ours. Diving, not bad. But man flight just doesn't work. Anyway, it doesn't have to. We found a way. We are the only four-footed animal who has two of them free to use, for progress. The only one, with one striking exception. We used those free hands to make weapons and tools, and we developed our brains and thought out ever better instruments. It all began in a primitive way with stones, sticks for hammering, or just a leaf for catching ants. Up to recently, we thought that we were the only ones to use tools. But the chimpanzee in the forests of Africa does it as well. He uses tools. And the young ones watch how it's done. Many an ant climbs up the ape instead of the stick, but it's worth the bother for a tasty tidbit.
This gunfish also has a special way of catching insects. He gets them above the surface. The Egyptian vulture just loves ostrich eggs, but he can't get them open with his beak alone. He's found a way. This one is still a young bird. That's a full grown one. On the coast of California, there are animals who also use stones as tools, the sea otters, saved from extinction in the nick of time. They live on shellfish, but shellfish are hard to open. That's why they bring up a stone as well. And then it works. They take the stone with them under their arm each time they make another dive. In the evolution of man, the decisive difference between us and the animals is that we can record our experiences for others and hand them down to future generations. A gigantic memory bank of knowledge and experience. His eagerness for knowledge also sought to discover the secrets of life itself. Countless animals were killed by him in the search of life's mysterious workings. We remained hunters, but we can also aim and shoot like this. By observing the natural behavior of animals, we can find out more about the origin and meaning of our own behavior as individuals and collectively as herd animals. The gnu or wildebeest is such a herd animal and every year he migrates to better pastures. This is what life means on Earth, searching for food, existing. 
breeding, dying. With the herd go the beasts of prey, the cheetah, the hyena, the wild dogs, and they don't always get off without a scratch. Wild dogs also live in groups. Their success depends on teamwork. Before they start hunting, they confirm their mutual understanding. Competitors are greeted with less friendliness. In a herd, the stronger animals live longest. The weak and the old are the first and easiest prey. The sick ones, too. In nature, there's no time to die quietly. Vultures clean up what's left after the hunt with aggressive competition. Impressive appearance, attack and withdraw. Young animals are the most vulnerable, but they know they have the protection of their parents. The zebra protects her young from lions. The lioness protects her young so that they become big and strong enough to tackle a zebra. Elephants, too, protect their young by walling them in with their bodies.
The GNU calf knows its mother from its first minute of life and knows it has to follow her. Soon enough, it is trained to stay by her side whatever happens. Keep together. And the hard fact of a threatened existence is this. Any young animal who loses its mother has no chance unless he finds her again. Another mother will not adopt the calf, even if she's lost her own. Perhaps she's the one, a lonely cow searching about. If she isn't the mother and he's not her lost calf, she'll try to get rid of him as soon as possible. Sentimentality is only for humans. Nature can't afford that luxury. No further protection, exhaustion is final and complete. There'll be no tomorrow. Many of them will perish. Most of them, in fact. The savagery of savage beasts is no idle story. That's the way they're made, and that's the way they are. that. The spectators may leave.
wildebeests with calves often herd together under the protection of a dominant bull. Whenever he can, he scares off the enemy. But other bulls as well. He doesn't allow them near his harem. Fighting of this sort is to be found amongst nearly all living creatures. At times over territory, at times for a position in the hierarchy, and often over the favours of a mate. Here it's a long, slow battering. There it starts with a gnashing of teeth. But it's seldom a fight to the death. Animals don't kill their own kind. The weaker are allowed to escape. Among animals, anyway. Dutch meadows can also be the arena for the combative display of gamecocks, who protect their own small bit of ground in the hope of being chosen by a female. This female. However much of a fuss they make, she'll do the choosing. In the Antarctic Sea, there's fighting too, by elephant seals. Two young bulls have got their eye on the same harem. Here too, one of them bows out. Battle is done in all sizes. The male stickleback creates a territory for himself around the nest he makes. That one there, and this one here. Here and the there is important for them, and they're prepared to do battle for them. This creates a boundary. When the plant in the middle has been accepted as a boundary, they'll no longer trespass on each other's territory. A threat with their stickles is enough. And from the side, they look bigger to each other. The need of a territory is apparent when a female enters it to deposit her eggs. The male has to lead her undisturbed to the nest. can quietly show her the way because that one over there will not disturb them now. Here it is, and this is how you get in.
vibrating the tail encourages egg laying. He over there is still sticking to the rules. The eggs are now in the nest. The male swims through to fertilize them. Cool and quick. She's off. The male pushes everything into its proper place and attends to the rest of it. This is the way the Toki shows that he is above all the others and master of this territory. The Thompson gazelle acts differently. He marks the grass stalks with a smelly brown spray from a gland under his eye. Mine, that means. Mine. If one occupant comes too close to another, they start a boundary dispute. Threats are always better than fights. This defiant stamping with a tiny little hoof seems futile against a dangerous beast of prey. Cheetahs often go hunting together and take it in turns, for each of them can only run for about 12 seconds at top speed. But that's at some 70 miles an hour. A gazelle on his own territory who runs into a lurking cheetah runs into a bit of bad luck. The gazelle has one advantage, he can dodge like lightning. A cheetah can't. His mate now takes over. The cheetah missed the curve. The dodgers got away. This time, at least. Often there's a less happy ending. When they're hungry, they kill at sight. But once their bellies are full, the stimulus fades. The condemned creature waiting to be killed. The world is all around, the scrub, the grass. But the young one no longer lies between its parents. It's not a little loved one now. It's a little tasty one. It's somebody else's child in the cheetah's mouth. The puma's child in the puma's mouth. The same dangerous weapon is now restrained from biting. The family young is looked after. The alien young is eaten. From the tropics to the Antarctic. From thousands of miles away, the albatross comes to breed on Albatross Island, near South Georgia. Adapted to life in the ocean, he can glide for hours on his enormous wings, nine feet wide from tip to tip.
here on Albatross Island, there'll be a male calling for this female, too. If she fancies him, the courting dance can begin. And this creates a bond which generally leads to a lasting union. No other bird will be able to break this bond. A single glistening egg will be laid. It takes 13 months for the young one to be able to fend for itself. This is the call of a king penguin. They can recognize each other by the call in a crowd of thousands down in South Georgia. And they'll always find each other. Now you had to have a special sort of walk. That's the way to get one to follow. It's like this the world over. And if you don't make a hit right away, you keep a lookout for some other bird who's calling. But there are already a few rivals. And rivals often make trouble. Anyway, there'll always be another. And when it gets to the point where he likes her and she likes him, the outcome is all the beauty of love that living creatures feel for each other. Then comes the prelude to mating. But penguins huddle together for safety. This means always in a huddle. And this means that mating is constantly disturbed by a third or a fourth or a fifth. Jealous, maybe? But however hindered or disrupted, the mating takes place. And then come five days of waiting for the egg. Waiting together. 
the pains begin. Claws dig into the hard ground. They don't make nests. Everything in their lives is either wet or hard. The egg is hatched out under a fold of skin. They take turns in hatching the egg for 54 days. Each one in his own small spot and just out of the reach of the beak of his next door neighbor or the one in front or behind. 54 days, rain or shine. Last year's young stand around waiting too. Waiting, just waiting for their parents who must bring them food from the sea. They and their parents find each other by their call. And not one of them has the same tone or rhythm. Some of the parent birds are on their way to the sea. Others are returning with a crop full of food. listen. But again and again they have to run the gauntlet between the pecking beaks of the others. When they found each other, the call is confirmed once more. Yes, it's us, all right. Then comes the begging for food. Slowly, the young ones lose their down. Well, more or less. Under the down lies the lovely white plumage. This one's ready. Well, nearly. When a penguin finds that another is too close, a good old row breaks out. A nasty problem for the penguin on an egg because he can't fight back for fear of breaking the egg. <laughs> a 
Only when a beleaguered bird sees a chance to get away with the egg and rescue it will there be peace again. And then, after all those restless days, comes the moment to give the call for the first time to one who must get to know it by heart. The same sharp beak is now in the service of motherhood. Why do penguins deliberately choose the discomfort of sitting on top of one another? Surely there's room enough. But this one is vulnerable. It's safer to be close together. They bar the way against the enemy, the birds of prey. Those at the edges run great risks, especially for the young bird left alone for a moment. The outside edge is a deadly peril. The stormy petrel and the skewer keep a sharp lookout for any egg or baby bird within reach. Once more down to the sea in search of food. The hills on the eastern bank of Lake Tanganyika in Tanzania are thickly overgrown. Here and there the rainforest seems impenetrable. Yet it is crisscrossed with trails, not man-made. The domain of anthropoid apes, wild chimpanzees. In the search for the sources of our own social behavior, many comparative traits can be most clearly observed here. <coughs> Chimpanzees have established differences in rank. This female, lower in rank than this one, reaches down to her in respectful greeting. When greeting a male, it is usual for the female to present herself. Generally, the posture remains merely symbolic. The approach of a dominant male can be noticed from the behavior of the others. <laughs> the 
Look out, here comes the boss. And by the way, he himself wants no misunderstanding on this point. When he's more or less made the required impression, things quieten down. The first of them come to do homage or to present themselves. Gradually, they form groups to devote themselves to a task as precise as it is soothing, grooming each other, an important element in their social relationship. If you show interest in a little chap like this, you'll get a speedy hands-off. And that's discouraging. But not for long. After all, the little one is within easy reach. And who can resist a baby? lucky day today. If there's a lot of tasty food somewhere about, bananas for example, they behave just as we do, especially if there's competition. All the subordinates can do is to start begging. Pinching is forbidden. A tactful presentation and everything's all right. The 
The bosses make sure they get their share. Others try it with charm and flattery. A banana, please. No, but you can shake my hand. Mother and son, how can he get hold of a banana? <coughs> By just being a smart little fellow. Playing together, chimpanzees learn to get along with each other. <laughs> and in play, they learn that the booms are different. If it's got a bit too rough, you must be prepared to make up with the stronger. It's only recently been discovered that chimps don't eat only fruit and plants, but flesh as well. Now and again, there's one who grabs a young baboon, and they all want to be there. Tremendous excitement, as if they've broken a taboo. But the one who catches and kills usually keeps his booty. The others just hope for a morsel. Toward evening, each chimpanzee makes his bed for that night. A few bent branches, that's all. This is how a chimp calls a girl. an ape, an anthropoid ape. 
night is falling. There's a lot in their behavior that sets one thinking. Thinking about the origins of our own behavior. Too similar to be accidental. This was, in fact, one of our ancestors, a sort of distant relative of ours and of the anthropoid apes who lived in Africa a mere two million years ago. This is what he is now, the comparatively vulnerable, unclothed ape man who took the clothes to become the smartly clad mass man of today. Physically, we've not changed much since the days when we roamed the plains as hunters. But from the time that we began to use our heads and our hands were free to fashion weapons and tools, we became more and more self-confident. Although we look a bit different from the other animals, and feel decidedly the stronger, what we still have in common is that we too are impelled to hold our own, to care for our offspring, and to survive. But sooner or later, we too must die. We're a supremely successful species. We know how to prolong life. We've learned to improve the chances for survival. But through this, we increase in ever-growing numbers. Frightening numbers. Because of this, we're obliged to extend our environment, always at the cost of other lives. And altogether, we have created a new artificial environment, spreading out into a new jungle. environment changed beyond recognition, to which we have to adapt ourselves. But just how far are we able to do so? Are our behavior patterns able to cope with it? Although we live packed like sardines, we try nevertheless to get out of each other's way in an orderly manner. We avoid undesired contacts. Too close contact makes us irritable. Just like the animals, we want the other fellow to keep his distance. Each one to his own small space within the colony. We want to feel protected, to be boss in a house of our own. This is my territory and I set my mark on it just like the dog in his own fashion. And the Thompson gazelle with his scent gland. We mark out our bit of ground, sometimes with threats. <coughs> we know the feeling of territory. And in our mutual behavior, we know that we are playing a role. At this signal, you stop without question. But you don't stop for just anybody. We've clothed him with power. And the clothing must suit the part. It must look impressive. Make him look bigger. Command respect. किया 
To play a leading role, to be dominant, great and small battles have to be won. Uh, whether Senator Humphrey and I make a deal to support each other. But when five fingers are balled into a fist, you have a considerable instrument of defense. You can fight with words, or you can come to blows to get your own way. We know this from childhood on. We have a boundless need for trials of strength. We call them contests. And in them, we too play according to the rules of the game. The opponent doesn't have to be killed. You attack, and you withdraw. One of them is the biggest, the strongest. Then come number two and three in the hierarchy. A hierarchy, the employees, the heads of department, the management, another hierarchy, the sergeant, the lieutenant, the captain, the major. Ever more manpower. The hierarchy of the church, in which a representative of the Almighty stands above us. We bow down before the All Highest. But we also bow our thanks to an audience. We make ourselves smaller. Thus, in social intercourse, we make use of a rich store of expressions, signs, and signals which serve as language. So make use of conventional expressions as signals which have to be understood and acted upon. They are the rules of the game. And we use our faces to show what we feel, what we mean. just like the animals do. It is these signals to each other which control a great part of our everyday life. Other signs awaken our desire to buy, as eye-catchers, sturdy, impressive, striking, excessive, decorative. But we are not the only ones to be enticed by intensified stimuli. If we give a seagull the choice between his own egg and an artificial one which is larger, more tempting in color and markings, which one will he choose? He couldn't resist temptation. Neither could she. But these too are signals which call for reaction.
signals which provoke interest. Curiosity about the opposite sex, which starts at an early age, and there's no harm in talking openly about it. The teacher asks, all the pictures you brought are photographs of naked women. Why is that? And the girl says, well, the boys brought those pictures, and they're not interested in pictures of naked men. The impulse to mate also involves all sorts of signals which will bring two partners together in a prelude to mating. Offering a present in the form of a flower. Or better still, a fish can improve the mood. The impulse for sexual reproduction is universal and strong because the combination of the characteristics of two living beings must always give rise to a new life that is different and unique. child has to be given protection and food by its mother and has to receive warmth and attention from her. And with this care, the child learns to whom it belongs. Only within the family can it develop harmoniously. Parents adapt themselves to the child, even in their speech. Risa's monkey, too, has to learn who its mother is. When he's born, he only knows that she's something hairy to cling to. Experiments prove that when he's made to choose, he'll prefer a hairy surrogate mother to a hairless one, even though only the hairless one gives milk.
goslings will take for their mother the first large object which they see moving in their neighborhood. We know this from experiments which have proved that they can be misled in this way. Newly hatched goslings will follow a human being too, if this was the first object they saw on emerging from the egg. Conrad Lorenz learnt in this way to understand the language of geese. For example, this is how an adult goose greets its young. And they expect mother to take them into the water. Song is for many birds the means of recognizing their kind. And as young birds, they must get to know and then imitate this song. The bullfinch has proved to be very good at this because when a human being has acted as its parent from babyhood, it imitates his parental signature tune. It's clever, but it's the wrong tune. Human young will also learn and gain experience at the proper time for it. It will explore its surroundings, and the presence of the mother will give it a feeling of security. This rhesus monkey, too, regards his surrogate mother as a safe base from which to explore a strange object. And if real danger approaches round the corner, he takes refuge only with his mother. He takes refuge with his surrogate mother. It's safer there than to flee. The young discover the possibilities of movement. You keep on learning, from contact with your kind as well. You learn the game of attack and retreat. But in the presence of these normal rhesus monkeys, the one who has lived isolated with only his surrogate mother is in deadly fear of these strange creatures.
This tiny chick only knows the companionship of this wooden cone and has been deprived of contact with his own kind. They at least learn to act out their aggression on each other. All he has for this is his wooden cone. When, as a fully grown cockerel, he meets a hen for the first time, he proves to be a total and permanent misfit as a partner. His mind is deformed. And when this rhesus monkey, which is only known as surrogate mother, becomes a mother herself, she cannot possibly know how to treat her baby, as a normal mother does. She just doesn't know. These are drastic experiments which are not carried out on human beings. Not as experiments, at least. But they can teach us something about ourselves. Because for the development of our behavior, we too need the dependable mother figure to gain all sorts of experiences in these first sensitive periods. No matter how tender a substitute mother may have been, presently a new face will take over. In our environment, too, we have to get adjusted at an early age. We can't escape each other. There are too many of us on this earth. We're surrounded by fellow men. These mice can't escape each other either, but their number is suited to the available space and they're still a healthy community. A similar area with sufficient food, now overpopulated. Here, they've fled to this platform. Over there, it's not necessary. A regular life is possible. Here, disorder reigns. Over-irritation, brutalizing experiences. In human society, too, densely crowded conditions can be one of the reasons for growing aggression. has the ability to form alliances with his fellow men. Here is a group on their captured spot. And there are the outsiders who have to keep at a distance and mustn't interfere with them. We constantly form groups, the family group, the working group, the club, the ideological groups, the religious groups, each of them with their own distinguishing mark, their own banner, their own interest. To be a member of a group gives protection and strength. Groups represent interests, 
which will figure more heavily as the groups grow larger. And if groups find that their interests are being challenged, they start to threaten. And this becomes more serious as the group becomes larger and the power of the ideology becomes stronger. to exterminate ourselves for differences in ideologies, theories, or religions. We fight like beasts, but we are the only mass murderers of our own kind. He must get out, but doesn't have to be killed. Animals, in fact, have no ideologies or theories or religions to fall for. We outshine all other animals with the achievements of our highly developed intellectual capacities when it comes to living. With our immense numbers, we have occupied the earth ruthlessly and without thinking of the consequences. distorted, polluted, and poisoned our environment. And at the same time, there's a mass urge to get away from it in search of an environment compatible with nature. In our boundless diligence and in our pride of achievement, we gradually have contrived and created things and conditions, the consequences of which we do not know or don't want to know. We do not even know whether life under these conditions will remain possible. same time, we despoil things which we cannot do without. Air, to name one, or water. We thus risk perishing in our own dirt. Still within us, there are the traces of the ancient hunter. After all, our behavior has the same origin as that of the animal. We 
too are a product of evolution, affected by the conditions of life. An evolution that will not cease to continue also without us. It is up to us to survive, not to vanish as a species destroying itself.